what is up, pincers, fencers, and smart sequencers. Thanks for sitting down at the messy desk with me. As always, I am your host, the human embodiment of one too many pieces of chocolate. Today, I want to add to the growing list of videos uh, that I have labeled something along the lines of, I'm the only one who's done them, and no one else has done them, and so they are unique, and you love me for it. Editing Dan is going to have a heck of a time putting all those words on the screen in time with my voice. You do it, Editing Dan. You do it or you get put in the box. Uh, anyway, I want to talk to you about trig conditions. Now, this is something that I've thought about making a video on for a long time, but I always thought uh, they could just crack open the manual and read what the dang things do. But then it occurred to me, then it occurred to me, I don't crack open the manual to see what these dang things do. So if I don't, Surely there are people out there that also don't and wonder what the heck their deal is. Uh, surely they understand, you know, some of the simpler ones, but what are some of the more complex ones doing? I'll level with you here. I kind of don't understand what some of the more complex ones are doing, but relax. We're going to work through it. Even if we don't figure it out right now, someone in the comments who's smarter than me will. So that's what we call delegation of responsibility. Okay, so in case you've just gotten the Octatrack, it's your first Electron device, you have no idea what's going on, let's talk about what trig conditions even are. So here I have a collection of triggers, right? I am sending a signal to the sampler saying, hey, play this sample here, 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 and so on, right? Really simple stuff, it's an on-off signal. But what we can do on the Octatrack and on Electron devices in general that you can't always do on other devices is get a little fancy with these on-off signals. For instance, maybe we want one to happen every second time the sequencer comes back around, or maybe we want it to happen 25% of the time, or maybe we want it to happen only if the trigger before it happens. These are what trigger conditions allow us to do. So let's go into that a little bit. I'm gonna start with the simplest applications and then we'll get a little more fancy as we go along. Nothing's gonna to be too crazy because I'm not too smart, but I'm sure that my loyal viewer base full of really intelligent Giga Chads will tell you down below all the really, really sick, interesting tricks you can do with trigger conditions. So the simplest trigger condition to understand, I think, is this one. First, it's really simple. This trigger will play the first time the sequencer starts and never again. So I want you to pay attention here. I'm going to go ahead and play this, and you'll notice that the sequencer will restart, but this trigger will not re-trigger. Let's listen. Now the slice is playing all the way through, but it's not triggering anymore, and it'll never trigger again. It triggered the first time, and it will never trigger again. That's what the first trigger condition does. Really great for like impact sounds, um, like down risers, that kind of thing when you're switching between patterns. You really only want that effect to happen once, so you have it happen then, and boom, you're good. Um, in this instance, I think what might work better is if I use this one here. Where is it? There. One of four, which basically just means happen one of every four times, the first of every four times. So it's going to happen the first time, it's going to go around three more times, and then it'll happen again. Uh, this just happened to work out that the slice lasts exactly as long as four bars in 128 BPM. Just happened to work out that way. Uh, but in other instances, you might need to kind of toy around a little bit. Um, but this sort of thing, the blank of blank, um, is incredibly useful for giving the impression that your sequence is longer than it really is. So for instance, if I come to my kick drum here, I have a trigger condition here that says two of two, which basically means happen every second time. So when I play, it'll go doom, 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 right? I have all this other stuff here. Don't worry about that. Just pay attention to this trigger here. Didn't happen. And now it does happen. Great. And this sort of blank of blank trigger condition, you know, one of two times, three of four times, etc., I think is my most commonly used one. Um, and you can go really deep with it. So at the end of the video, I think we're going to circle back and I'll show you just, you know, how you can apply that in a little bit more depth than I have currently here. Let's look at some other triggers in the meantime to check out what some other trick conditions do. This one here, and in fact, all of these triggers have a percentage condition on them. So really simple, these will happen 50% of the time. This will happen 67%, 67, 50. I just sort of turned knobs at random there. 
and it's great for kind of generative sequences. So what I did was I sliced up a sample. I have a bunch of different slices playing here, and then each of them is going to trigger 50% of the time, 67% of the time, whatever. So let's listen. So you can hear that when there's blank spaces, the slices kind of play out a little longer. Um, and it just gives you this developing kind of texture. Worth noting, really worth noting, 50% of the time doesn't mean one of every two times. That's deterministic. This is probabilistic. So every time this trigger comes around, there's a coin flip. Will it happen or will it not? 50-50 chance it'll happen. 67% chance it'll happen here, not one of two times. It's really easy for people to get that confused. So while you're using these deterministic and probabilistic trigger conditions, you might find yourself uh, in a situation where you don't want a trigger to happen right after another trigger for a variety of reasons. Luckily, Electron has you covered with the pre-trig condition. So I'll go ahead and show you this, which actually is using the negative pre. Before we talk about negative pre, let's talk about what pre means. Pre means only happen if the trigger immediately before it happens. Negative pre means only happen when the trigger immediately before it doesn't happen. Now, this trigger here is happening 75% of the time. This trigger here has a negative pre. So the 25% of the time that this doesn't trigger, this will trigger. So let's listen and see if we can hear how often this triggers. There you go, it triggered. And that's all it is. Um, if for instance, I wanted to have just a normal pre here, what I could do is put one here and say pre only happen when this one happens. And then let's say I make this one of every two times. And you see it doesn't happen there. So that's what the pre and negative pre do. It's really useful and I highly recommend that you remember that and that you keep that in your tool belt while you're trying to uh, program sequences because it comes in handy a lot more often than you'd think. When used alongside those percentage trigger conditions, it keeps things controlled and generative all at the same time, which I found to be super useful. Um, okay, what else do we got going on? This is one of the weirder ones um, and I wanna talk about it now because I'm, I'm still not sure I fully understand. But there's a concept in the Oct track called neighbor tracks. For instance, this track here actually is a neighbor track. And essentially what it is, is that it just takes this track here and funnels it into this other track so that you can have more effects and more LFOs, kind of just what it does. But you can also use the neighbor concept for a trigger condition. Um, and so what I have here is I have this hi-hat pattern. Right, it's a little swung, it's a little groovy. I have this open hi-hat pattern. Great. Uh, what is happening is on three, seven, 11, and 15, I have the neighbor condition, which basically says, don't play this if the neighbor is playing. So what I don't understand is there's a negative neighbor, which I would assume would do what the regular neighbor is doing, which is saying, don't play this when the neighbor is playing. I don't really understand. I've read the manual. It did not help. Uh, so Giga Chaz down in the comments, you already know what to do. You better pop off down there and explain it to your stupid dad. Uh, and the beautiful viewers watching, I already knew. I already knew it. I'm just testing my viewers to make sure they know. So don't worry. I'm still smart. I'm still a credible source of information. Please keep watching me on youtube.com. Uh, right, so that's the neighbor and negative neighbor thing. Don't really understand it, uh, but it's making me a pretty angry neighbor. Uh, so let's move along before I get too upset. The other thing that is kind of interesting is what's known as fill. So I have this open hi-hat sequence, as I mentioned. And it's great and we love it. There's nothing wrong with it. But what if I want it to be more interesting? Well, you see all these triggers here. We're only hearing those open hi-hats. What's going on with that? Well, check this out. Well, how are you doing that, Octodad? Well, I'm going to tell you. So just relax and stop using that voice, please. It's a little unnerving. Um, the fill parameter on these lit up triggers is basically just saying only play these triggers when the fill mode is activated. And to activate that, you 
hold up and press the page button down. You can see these buttons lighting up. Alternatively, you can latch them. So if I hit play, it stops. I can latch it again or on command. Fantastic. Now on the dig attack and the dig tone, there's just a little button you can press to achieve this. Uh, but on the octa track, you have to do a key combination because it's the octa track, and I think it was implemented later. Uh, yeah, so it's really useful for stuff that you want to do performatively. So like, I don't want that da 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 every single time. Not what I want. But as like a little turnaround, you know, I'm I'm here. And then we're back, right? That kind of thing. So that is the fill. There's also a negative fill, uh, which contrary to what you might think is not the gritty reboot of fill of the future. It's actually just a trigger condition. Um, what it is, is the opposite of what fill is. It'll play the trigger all the time, unless you're holding the fill parameter. I don't have an example of that, but you're smart. You get it. I want you to close your eyes and imagine it. You're doing it so well and you're really rich. Wow. That was a cool Imaginarium we just did there. Okay, so look, I've been going pretty fast. It's been really fast paced. It's been hard for you to keep up with me. I understand, I'm very attractive. It's hard to stay focused, especially in my new sweet threads. Let's go over what we've learned, okay? The sequencer is sending on signals to the samples saying, hey, please play them here. But if we hold this little button and press right or left on the micro timing arrows, we can put in a trick condition. What trick conditions are there? There's fill, which is we hold the button down and it only happens while we're holding the button down in the cool key combination that makes us look really smart and cool. There's the first for triggers that we only want to happen the very first time and never ever again, we never wanna see it again. There's negative first, which is don't happen the first time. I don't wanna see you here early in the morning. But after that, after 10 o'clock, when I've had my coffee and I've had my morning poop, come on in, I'd love to have you here and you can stay as long as you'd like. There's a uh, neighbor, which is inscrutable to me. And then there's negative neighbor, which is me trying to understand neighbor and getting really upset. Uh, and then there's percentiles. Every time the trigger comes around, how likely is it that it is going to happen? Probabilistically, not deterministically. And then there's blank of blank, which is one of two, three of four, all the way up to eight of eight, which is the first of every second time, deterministically second of every second time, etc etc and finally you got pre it'll happen if the trigger before it happens or negative pre it'll happen when the trigger before it doesn't happen so you got it that's all of them and i know it seems like a lot at first but it's actually not that difficult um and people will ask you know why do you use x y or z and when um the answer frustratingly is it depends uh because you know different situations are going to call for different trigger conditions that's why they're conditional um but it's a really really useful thing to have in your tool belt and to utilize while you're working with the octatrack i can't imagine using the octatrack or really any electron gear without them it's like the big reason to own electron gear is trigger conditions and the kind of fancy stuff you can do with them so now that we've spent like 15 minutes just rambling through what all of them do in the various situations you might want to use them, let's go a little deeper um, and let's look at this kick track here because there's kind of a lot going on. Um, I'm just going to hit play and let's listen to how it sounds. Okay, so here's what's happening. I have a rock solid four on the floor groove, one, five, nine, 13. That's never changing. What is changing, however, is all these little accented kicks around them. I have, as I mentioned earlier, this trigger here, which is happening two of every two times. This is happening one of every four times. Then here, I got a little spicy. I have a 75% trigger condition. Immediately following it, I have a negative pre, which as we just mentioned a little while ago, will only happen when this one doesn't happen. So if this is happening 75% of the time, the 25% of the time that it doesn't happen, this will happen. Here, I have this happening three of every three times, so the third of every three times. And so what ends up happening is that we go through, this doesn't happen, right? We have bump, 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 right? This is not gonna happen for three more times. Now we're in the second phase. This is triggering 75% of the time. If this doesn't trigger, this will trigger. 
we come through the second time. But, 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 right? Before we come back around. Second time. Bum, bum. Then we come back around a third time. That's when this one will happen. And then it just restarts like that every time. So let's listen one more time with that in mind. And so while it doesn't sound like much on its own, in the context of its own kind of groove, I think it's really fun. Um, and it just adds life to your sequences. You know, I always talk about don't repeat yourself too much. Don't let things get too static, too boring. Keep trying to spice up your sequences in one way or another. Trigger conditions are essential to that kind of philosophy. So if you want to have your sequences be kind of lively and, and shifting and changing, I cannot recommend you use them enough. Most of you probably already are, but if you're newer to the Octatrack and you're just kind of wondering what the hell these things are, and for some reason you didn't want a straightforward video, you wanted a dorkily clad dude in a giant's uniform to sweatily explain it to you, scattered like, uh, but very charismatically, I hope, uh, then thanks for watching. Uh, that's all I got for you today. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I will be back next week with another video. As per usual, I am just flying. And where am I, what am I flying by? I don't know. I'm flying by the seat of my pants. Uh, and I'm loving it, actually. I don't care. I don't give a heck and dang anymore. And I'm a rebel bad boy, and everyone loves it. So I hope to see you then. And in the meantime, thanks one more time for watching. You could have sat down with anybody on the internet this week, but instead you chose to sit down with me, a sweaty, stinky man who loves Giants baseball. Uh, I will see you guys next week. And until then, I'm Daniel. This is The Messy Desk. And I love you more than I love this very expensive piece of clothing. I'll see you next week.